Well, are you ready for your breakthrough? You know, we talked about this last week and, you know, towards the end of 2020, I spent a lot of time on reasons to be optimistic. Proverbs chapter four, verse 18 says that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It gets brighter and brighter. It gets brighter and brighter. Our lives are not going to get dimmer and dimmer. Our lives are not going to get darker and darker. Our lives are going to get brighter and brighter. Your life is going to get brighter and brighter because you are on the path of the righteous. You're the righteousness of God because Jesus became sin for us. We became the righteousness of God. He made us his righteousness. He made us right with him where we can stand before him without fear, without guilt, without condemnation, without shame. We can stand at the throne of his grace to receive. We can stand before the devil and all of his cohorts of darkness, and we have authority over them because we are you are the righteousness of God. So get ready for things to get better and better. Stop listening to the doom and gloom prophecies. Stop listening to the getting darker and darker prophecies, because the Bible says the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter until the full day. And in fact, I've been wanting to share each Sunday this year or each Sunday this month, at least. I really want to talk to you about having this perspective of expectation of things getting better and better and better. And, you know, the scripture that uh, that I brought you to for the last several weeks, I think, is in John 11, verse four. And it says this sickness will not end in death. This sickness, Jesus said about Lazarus, this sickness will not end in death. Doesn't matter how it's going. It matters how it ends. See. That sickness did have death attached to it because Lazarus did die. But Jesus spoke. The truth that is greater than. The current present circumstance and the truth is this sickness will not end in death. It may include death. It may pass through death. You might be passing through the valley of the shadow of death. But this situation that you're going through, the situation we're all going through, is not going to end in negativity and death. But it's going to cause the glory of God and the glory of God is going to cause it to change. Remember when I talked about five reasons to be optimistic in the last one, we drilled down on the last week or two breakthroughs and the light of revival are always on the other side of darkness. Breakthroughs and revival are all are always on the other side of darkness. You can look up today expecting your life to get brighter and brighter, expecting your path to get brighter and brighter, expecting whatever you're going through is not going to end the way it feels right now. It doesn't matter how it started and it doesn't matter how it's going. What matters is how it ends and it's not going to end with you defeated. You see. Suffering loss is one thing. Being a loser is another. We're not losers. We may have suffered loss, but God is the restorer of all that's lost. We're not losers. We're the head. You're not a loser. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You might have had a loss. It doesn't make you a loser. You you are the righteousness of God. But I want to get into this one in particular and just continue to drill down on your breakthrough. And remember, your breakthrough begins. Your breakthrough begins when you have a discovery. Every breakthrough begins with a discovery. The significance of a breakthrough, as we mentioned earlier, was that you don't go back to the way it was. You don't go back. You keep going forward. A scientific breakthrough is knowledge gained. It's used to keep making further breakthroughs after that in medical breakthroughs. You don't go back to doing things as had been done before. You use the knowledge that you've gained to advance and move forward. Technological breakthroughs are used to invent better things. All these improvements are made based on the breakthrough that was obtained. It's true in our walk with God. We make progress and we move forward with the things that we've learned when we've had a major breakthrough in some area. And you're about to have one if you haven't yet. And so your breakthrough begins with the discovery. 
when penicillin was discovered, there was a breakthrough of healing, different times, different seasons in history. Something was discovered and there was a breakthrough, the telephone and there was a breakthrough in communication, the Internet and there was a breakthrough in communication, the television. There was a breakthrough in entertainment and news and information. And there's just you could just go on and on. But the breakthrough that is started by a discovery, the discovery that I want to share with you today is the discovery of the treasure that's inside of you. There's a treasure inside of you. And I want to help uncover the treasures that are inside of you. In Second Corinthians, Chapter four, I want you to see this in verse seven, Second Corinthians, Chapter four, verse seven. And let's read this because this talks about a treasure. And he says in Second Corinthians four, seven, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We have this treasure. Now, he says we're afflicted. He says we're crushed. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Why can we be afflicted, but not crushed? How is it we can be persecuted and not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed? because of verse seven, because there's a treasure inside of you. This treasure is in earthen vessels. The treasure is in earthen vessels and we're made from the dust of the ground. We're the earthen vessels. Wherever you see earthen vessels in the Bible, it's symbolic of humanity. It's symbolic of our human life. This treasure God is talking about. It's in earthen vessels. He's put a treasure inside of you. He's put great treasure in you. It's from God. It's what enables you to endure affliction and not be crushed, to endure being perplexed. Man, 2020 perplexed us. 2021 may be still perplexing us a little the first week or two. But you know what? It doesn't matter because we're not going to despair. Why? Because we have a treasure inside of us. You can take away something on the outside of us, but we have a treasure on the inside of us. You can try to hurt us on the outside, but we got a treasure on the inside. Everything can fall around us, but we got a treasure tall inside of us. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in this world. And when you discover that treasure, that's what brings breakthrough. And that's why I want to take you to a familiar passage of scripture. I like to talk about this every year, but I I want you to get this in your every day in. Second Kings, Chapter four. He talks about this treasure that's inside of us, because so often we're looking for something outside to help our situation when really all the help we need is already in us because God put it there. Now, there was a certain woman, it says. Whose husband had died and the creditors were coming to take her sons as slaves. And she cried out to the prophet Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And they're going to take my sons. What do I do? The creditor has come to take my two children to make payment for what is owed. And notice. He she said, what am I going to do? And Elisha said, what do I, what do you have in your house? What shall I do for you? What do you have in your house? What are you going to do for me, Elisha? What am I going to do for you? What do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? Notice where the prophet takes her back to the house. He pointed her to her own house. And in this case, we're talking about the house of really the house can be. A symbol of several things, obviously, the house is a symbol of our temple We're the temple. Your body is the temple of God, the house of God. It's inside of you. Greater is he this in you than he this in the world. But the house is also the church, the house of God. We have inside of our. Individual lives, all that we need for a situation, whatever is not in there that we need is in the church. 
It's either in us or it's in our church family. Or it's in your physical house. You know, you have everything you need right there, but you get the point. The point is he pointed her to what she already had, because what you need is usually almost always connected to what you already have. What you need, the breakthrough you need is connected to what you already have. Sometimes we don't realize what we have. We don't use what we have. And then a crisis hits us. And I want to give you a help you with the perspective, because we're going to talk about perspective all month and maybe all year. But I want to hit you with this topic or this point about perspective. You see, remember how I've always said to you, treat anxiety as a signal to pray. Don't worry about anxiety. Treat it as a signal to pray. Don't treat it as an enemy. Treat it as a signal to pray. Don't treat loneliness as an as an enemy. Treat loneliness as a signal that God's drawing want you to draw closer to your communion with him. And in the same way with a crisis, we got to look at a crisis different than we used to look at it before a crisis or a problem in your life is not something to worry about. Why? Because it's a signal. And what is a crisis a signal of a crisis is a signal that there is a problem that God has already equipped you to handle. There is a problem that God has already equipped you to solve. A crisis is a signal that there is a problem that God has already equipped you to solve. Multitudes of people today are like this widow. So many Christians are like this widow. They're widowed from their source of security. They're widowed from power and joy. They're widowed from peace. They've been They've been cut off. Life cuts us off sometimes and makes us widows in a sense that the peace we used to have is dead to us. The joy we used to have is dead to us. The finances we used to have are dead to us. So in that, in that sense, you understand what I mean by how multitudes are widowed from their source of security and their source of provision. Thank God that whatever you've been, whatever you were married to before, that was your source of peace. You, you got something better that you're married to. You're married to Jesus. And that's a way greater source of peace. You're married to Jesus, such a way higher source of joy, such a way higher source of power, such a way higher source of love, such a way higher source of whatever it is that you need. But consider how God provided for this woman. The prophet didn't start by talking to her about something in heaven or something on earth somewhere. He pointed her to her own house. What you already need or what you need is already in the house. How many of us used to think I've been guilty of this, that people were going to be the solution or the answer, that the right spouse is going to be the solution or the answer that the right job is going to be the solution or the answer. The right president is going to be the solution or the answer. The right government is going to be the solution or the answer. The right business, the right this or that was going to be the solution. And I want you to know that someone else is not the answer. The prophet pointed her to her own house. The first key to the breakthrough that she needed was a shift of thinking. Listen to me now. I'm going to give you four things, I think, if we have time. The first thing that led to her breakthrough was a shift in her thinking. I know we took a took a minute to get to number one here today, <laughs> but we're there. The first thing that was the key to the breakthrough she needed was a shift of her thinking. It fits into the concept we've been talking about perspective, perspective. What you see is not what perspective perspective is not what you see. Perspective is how you see it, because two people can be looking at the same thing, but looking at it from a different angle, from a different way, You're looking at the same thing, but how you look at it, that's perspective. And he 
shifted her perspective. He got her thinking about what she already had rather than what she didn't have. He got her focused and God's trying to get us thinking about what we have rather than what we don't have. Even if there's something really important that you need, it still starts with a shift in your thinking and a shift in your perspective to what you already have. What you need starts with what you already have anyway. They needed to feed thousands, but they, it started with what they had. What do you have? Five loaves and two fish. What you have is always the secret. What you have is always the secret. How you look at what you have is always the secret to what you don't have. How you look at what you have is always the secret to the breakthrough that you need. As you are thankful for what you have, as you use what you have, as you recognize what you have, that is the secret power. That's where the power is to bring the breakthrough that you need. Boy, maybe I'm just saying it over again, but in a slightly different way, because it really does come back to what has God given us? It's doing inventory. We started in the pandemic last year, and one of the first things we talked about was we're going to the other side and what was what was going to equip them to go to the other side? It's what they already had in the boat. It's not what they didn't have. It's what they did have. They had a storm, but they had Jesus. They had a storm, but they had power. They had the, they had a storm, but they had words. They had a storm they had a promise. You see, everything you need starts with what you have. We're so used to focusing on what we lack. This woman's problem was all about what she didn't have. But this woman's solution was all about what she did have. You see, her problem was all about what she didn't have. Her solution was all about what she did have. You know, um, the treasure that's inside of you, we mistakenly believe it's something external, the treasure that we're looking for. We think that it's granted to us from something outside of us, and we need to shift our perspective and realize it's been granted to us by God, but it's inside of us. You know, the famous Andrew Carnegie, who whose name bears the um, Carnegie Hall, the famous Carnegie Concert Hall in New York City. During his life and during his time in business, he became one of the wealthiest men in the world, one of the wealthiest men in America. And he had the distinction and this, this was a long time ago. This is an incredible accomplishment that he had 43 millionaires that worked for him at his company. That would later the company that would later become U.S. Steel Company. He had 43 millionaires who worked for him. This is remember, this is like a million at that time would be maybe, I don't know, 10 million or more today. A reporter once asked him, how had he assembled such a team of established millionaires. Carnegie responded that those men had not been wealthy at all when he hired them. Carnegie responded and said they had become millionaires as a result of their hard work and the faith that they had in themselves, supported by the faith that Carnegie placed in them. So the reporter went on to say, but how did you train these men to become so valuable that you would pay them so much money. Carnegie replied that men are developed the same way gold is mined out of the earth. Several tons of dirt must be moved to mine out one ounce of gold, one ounce of gold from the ground. Several tons of dirt has to be moved to mine out one ounce of gold from the ground in our lives. Our lives have got have been piled. There's a lot of piles in our lives that need to be moved. A lot of thinking that needs to be moved. 
a lot of ways of looking at things that need to be moved to discover what's really inside of us. We have to be willing to remove the old ways of thinking, our old expectations. In fact, that leads me to point number two. The first thing that led to her breakthrough was a shift of thinking, a shift of perspective from what she didn't have to what she did have. What do you have in your house? Your maidservant has nothing. Verse two, except this jar of oil. I have nothing in the house except a jar of oil. There's always an except. Whenever you use the word nothing, look for the exception, because there's always something. When you think there's nothing, there's always something. There's always something. There's always something good in a situation. There's always something good in a person. There's always something good in you. When you think there's nothing, look for the good. She said, all I have is this jar of oil. So notice what happens here. What brings her breakthrough, the next thing was what Elijah said. Elisha said to her, go borrow vessels for your at large for yourself. From all your neighbors, not just one neighbor, from all of them, get empty vessels. Don't get a few man. This is the second thing that brings breakthrough when he says, don't get a few. What did he do? What was he doing to bring the breakthrough in her life? He was elevating her expectations, elevating her expectations. Don't just get a few. Don't expect for one jar of oil to pour into just one new vessel. Don't just get a few. Don't get your mind set on a few. Don't get your mind set on a little. Don't get your mind set on not having enough. Get your mind set on a lot of vessels. Get your mind set on, on abundance. Get your mind set on big expectations. If God can do exceeding abundantly above and beyond all that we can ask or think, then let's go ahead and ask big. Let's go ahead and think big and let him do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. He said to her, go, go get a vessel from all your neighbors, get vessels at large. Don't get vessels at small, get vessels at large. Get them from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Don't get a few. He's like, hey, small thinking isn't going to do here right now, lady. Small thinking isn't going to work for you right now. Don't lower your expectations, elevate your expectations. Now, listen, we need when we talk about elevating our elevating our expectations, we're elevating our expectations in God. We do need to lower our expectations of others. Because when we've got our peace attached to what somebody else can do for us, got our happiness attached to what somebody else can do for us, that's setting ourselves up for disappointment. But when we elevate our expectation of what God can do, look at what he's done. Boy, when you realize what he's done, you start elevating your expectation of what can be done and what he can do because of what he's already done. What is it that you need today? What breakthrough do you need? I want you to know, number one, shift your thinking from what you don't have to what you do have and start thanking God for what you do have. Start using what you do have. Don't wait to be a millionaire before you start being a tither. Don't wait till somebody apologizes before you start being a forgiver. Don't wait for somebody to be nice to you before you start being kind. Start with what you already have. Don't wait for the quote unquote church doors to open before you be plugged in and be connected all, you know, wherever you are. Be the church right where you are. Be the church. Extend this family wherever you go. I'm just using some examples, but you can come up with more, I'm sure. Shift your thinking from what you don't have to what you do have. Number two, elevate your expectations, elevate your expectations. Let's start believing big. Why should we start? Why should we start with believing small? We've already got small. We've already achieved small. We've already have little. So we might as well start thinking big. Our thinking little got us little. So <laughs> whatever little we got, it's because of how we thought. So let's elevate our expectations. You don't have to worry about getting more of anything. You have to focus on what you already have and then elevate your expectations that God can give you what you need. My God shall supply all 
your needs. How many preachers have just used that verse? I'm guilty of having done this in the past as well. Thank God, the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. And we don't have time to count how many chances that I've needed. Maybe you feel the same way about you. Don't talk about me. Don't think about me. Think about yourself right now. But you get my point. And the point is, is that we've all been given multiple chances to get this right. But so many have thought Philippians 4, 19, my God shall supply all your needs is just about money. My God, it's not. It's about all your needs. You have you have physical needs. That's part of all your needs that you have financial needs. That's part of all your needs. You have health needs. That's part of all your needs. You have relationship needs. That's part of all your needs. What have you been upset about? What have you been disappointed about? What have you been frustrated about? Why don't you recognize that need falls under the category of all your needs? According to his riches, it's not limited to just finances. It's that, but so much more peace that you need, the job that you need, the wisdom that you need, the answer that you need, the friend that you need, whatever it is that you need, he'll supply all your needs according to his. Aren't you glad it does that according to his poverty, according to his riches? God has riches. Wow. Don't take this to be a materialistic point. It's his riches are so much more than physical The riches of his love, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his grace. I need a lot of mercy. I need a lot of grace. How about you? Elevate your expectations is the point. I think in our spiritual walk with Jesus, sometimes we have a false sense of humility that expecting little is being humble, but true humility is expecting what God promised, not expecting little expect what he promised. If he promised little, then I would ex I, I will go ahead and humbly accept little. But if he promises an abundance of peace, an abundance of health, an abundance of answered prayer, an abundance of victories, then I'm going to go ahead and expect that because he promised that. Start elevating your expectations. Don't just get a few. He said, get a bunch of them, get a bunch of them. And then I love what the next thing that brings this woman's breakthrough is found in verse four. And Elisha says to her, hey, here's the next thing that I want you to do when you go and borrow those vessels. You shall go in back into your house and shut the door behind you and your sons. You shall shut the door. Verse five says, so she went from him and shut the door. I want to talk about this in verse four first. He said, once you gather those vessels, you and your sons, you and your sons, you and your family, you and your family were called to be a family. And he said, he said to her, go and shut the door, go into the house. Again, it can be the house of God. It can be your your house that you're watching in right now. The point is, he says, go with your family and shut the door. The third thing that I believe brings breakthrough in our lives is we have to learn to be door shutters. We have to learn to shut doors. So often we leave the door open to fear. We leave the door open to negativity. We leave the door open to the wrong relationships. We leave the door open to needing attention. I want you to shut the door on a few things today. I want you to shut the door on the way you used to think, thinking small, thinking about what you don't have. Shut the door on that and think about what you do have. Shut the door on that and thank God for what you do have. Shut the door on that and shut the door on thoughts of lack and start go and go into your house and stay connected to your house and shut the door to small expectations. 
Shut the door to limitations. Shut the door to what the teacher said about you, that you were stupid and you never amount to anything. Shut the door to what your parents did to you. Shut the door to the to uh, whatever was passed down from generation to generation. You're redeemed from the curse. Shut the door from expecting the curse to remain in you. You've been redeemed from the curse and you've been redeemed for the blessing from the curse for the blessing. We're not redeemed from the blessing. We're redeemed from the curse, but we're redeemed unto the blessing or for the blessing. The blessing is yours in Christ. Shut the door to expecting the curse. Shut the door to expecting negativity. Shut the door to expecting things to get worse and worse when the Bible promises us, when God promises us, when eternity promises us, when his eternal promise promises us that the path of the righteous, which is you in Christ, the path of the righteous will get brighter and brighter until the full day. So I'm not expecting things to get darker and darker. We're not coming into our darkest days. We don't have to get ready for dark days. We got to get ready for bright days. We got to start expecting the brightness, the brightness, the brightness of God, the light to come in, revival to come in, the breakthrough to come. Shut the door on low expectations. Shut the door on unbelief. Shut the door on people that are negative. Shut the door on the haters. Man, open it to love them and give them some love, but then shut the door on their hate that they're trying to send back. Let me tell you something. You've got to learn to shut the door on some people. Oh, well, Jesus wouldn't do that. Yes, he would. And yes, he did. He went into the house where um, Jairus, daughter was dead. He took Peter, James and John with him and everybody was in there and they were like, you'll never. He said, she's just sleeping. We're going to raise her up. And they started laughing at him and mocking him. And guess what the Bible says Jesus did? Uh, it's in Mark chapter five. Maybe our team will find it before I'm done with this sentence, but I, I don't remember the exact verse, but you can look it up. But the point is, is he, the Bible says he put them all out of the house, except Peter, James and John and the parents. He shut the door on all that, all the wrong people mocking and speaking negativity. All she, she'll never. She's dead. You'll never. There's no hope. I wonder how many times we've been told there's no hope. You need to shut the door on people. Let me be polite about it. If you if you, you know, <laughs> Better to be polite than impolite. You understand the point. It's the spirit behind it. Not saying that we're better than anybody. We're not saying that. That um, we're superior to anybody. We're not saying that. We should criticize others we're saying, look, people have opinions about you. Shut the door to that. Shut the door to people's hate. Shut the door to what other people's opinion or view of you is you can't you can't live. Stop living for what other people think about you. Maybe you're not, but sometimes we all have done that. After the, you see, go look in Mark five, verse 36. Look at verse 36. He got there. All these people. He said, don't be. He said, Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to don't be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James and John. Look at what it says in verse 38. And, he, and it says, and they came to the house and he saw the commotion, people loudly weeping and wailing and entering in. He said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, but putting them all out. Wow, there it is. Before the breakthrough came, before the miracle came, what did Jesus do? He put all the ones laughing. He put them out. He's putting them all out. That's shutting the door on the wrong people. He took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, entered the room where the child was, taking her by the hand, said, Talitha Kumai, little girl, I say to you, arise. breakthrough happened. Miracle happened. Shut the door. There are some things we got to shut the door to shut the door to unbelief, to low expectations. Shut the door to your old opinion of yourself because you are who God said you are. Shut the door to needing attention. Shut the door. There's so many things we could talk about shutting the door. But then the fourth thing that brought the breakthrough and we'll close with this is in verse six. Elisha said to the woman, he said, and when you shut the door behind you with your sons, start pouring, start pouring, start pouring. 
And what happened? She went in, shut the door and she started pouring in verse five. And when the vessels were full, she said, bring me another vessel. They said, son said to her, there are no more vessels. <laughs> and the oil stopped. And then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell now and pay all your debt and you and your sons can live on the rest of the oil. Can you imagine how much oil that must have been that they could actually live on it the rest of their lives? That they could pay their debts and live on the rest of the oil for the rest of their lives. What happened? How did the breakthrough happen? She shifted her perspective. She shifted her thinking from what she didn't have to what she did have. Number two, she elevated her expectation. Number three, she shut the door on the mindsets that she used to be in bondage to shut the door on the, the people that are naysayers, the dream killers, the negativity, the gossip, the whatever doesn't agree with love and doesn't agree with God's word. Shut the door on it. Small thinking, shut the door on it. And what do you do? Start pouring, start pouring, start pouring what God's given you. Start pouring it into others. Start pouring it into your children. Start pouring it into your church. Start pouring it into yourself. Just keep pouring because as you keep pouring into others, vessels, right? Vessels represent people as you keep pouring into others. The oil continues to flow. That's why we didn't. We never stopped winning souls and the oil oil kept flowing. We never stopped giving to missions and the oil kept flowing. We never stopped giving food away to people. and The oil kept flowing. Boy, if we ever stop pouring into others, the oil will stop. I think, according to this verse, I think I just want to anyway, I want to keep pouring into others because of how it blesses them, not just so that it can continue, but I want it to continue so I can be more of a blessing. Right. And that means having enough wisdom to keep pouring wisdom into people, keep pouring finances into people, generosity into people. All right. You got four things now. That activate it's a miracle breakthrough that you've been looking for and needing. Let's pray together right now. And first and foremost, if anybody's watching, you've never been born again. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord. Let's start right there. Heavenly Father, just pray this out loud after me. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ. That's it. Just pray that I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior and Lord. Come on, pray that into my life as my Savior. and Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins and he rose from the dead. And from this moment forward, I'm a child of God. Now, you just made the greatest decision of your life. And if you prayed that prayer, please contact me. Let me know. There's so many ways to contact us, but I have a link for you right on the screen or in the comment box. You'll see a link to my free gift that I want to give you the, a book called The Power of a New Life. We'll send, we'll, you can download it anywhere in the world. That's the easiest way to get it. And it's the next steps of your journey and your walk with God. And I congratulate you and thank God for you. All the angels in heaven rejoice over your prayer of salvation that you just prayed right now. Thank you praying with me. Let me know. And for everybody. Will us pray right now, say in the name of Jesus, I believe my days are getting better. My path is getting better. It's getting brighter and brighter because I'm the righteousness of God. I shift my thinking to what I have. I shift my thinking to what God's already done. I elevate my expectations. I'm not going to think small anymore. I shut the door on unbelief. I shut the door on the wrong thoughts. I shut the door on the wrong people. I shut the door on the wrong opinions of myself. And I start pouring into myself, into others, into my family, into my church, into the lost and the oil. Come on, say that. And the oil won't stop and the oil will keep flowing. We'll let it flow inside of you. If you need anything, let us know. We're here for you. Thank you for being a part. We're all in this together. We're better together. And I can't wait to see you at our next service. God bless.